2019 has not been a particularly good year for London aim-listed stocks. We saw the FTSE 100 and the FTSE 250 recently rise, and of course we got those record highs for the FTSE 250 index. But with political clarity now having been achieved, does this change anything for 2020? Chris Boxwell joins us now from Fundamental Asset Management, where he's a portfolio manager and a specialist in aim-listed stocks. How would you appraise 2019, first of all, Chris? Well, it's been a tricky one for AIM. I mean, markets in general, you've had the US market flying up 20-odd percent. And surprising, the FTSE 250 is similarly very strong performer, which is very surprising given its UK centric exposure. And AIM as an index has been a real laggard. Um, AIM's clearly had its problems. We've had a shorting attack on Burford, and which was AIM's largest company, which saw its share price fall. 50% or more. You've had accounting, you had the administration of patisserie holdings early in the year. Course, yeah. Then you had the accounting scandal more recently at, uh, at um, M&C Saatchi, which just to close the year. And in between that, you had issues at Gold Soccer Centers, albeit Gold wasn't a big company. But you've had lots of problems and scandals. And, and really, AIM has struggled to attract uh, the desired number of new companies. And that's the biggest issue for us. It's shrinking. We're getting rid of lots of the rubbish, but we're not attracting the, the required number of, uh, of newcomers. This says it all, 64 departures, 16 new arrivals. So the churn rate is, is going the wrong direction. Um, but we have spoken about this before. You had been concerned about AIM getting too big. This yeah, is one way of cutting it back yeah, down yeah. to size. It's true. And a lot of the, de of the 64 departures, this is net, by the way, of the readmissions. You know, some, some companies depart only to, re uh, to come back again, having done a reverse uh, yeah. transaction. But of the departures, a, a large number of them were, were, quite frankly, basket cases. A lot of them were, were loss-making. They'd been there a long time. And they needed to be cut out. The deadwood needed, needed to go. Saying that, we've also lost uh, uh, some decent companies as well, which is really frustrating. Telford Homes, Sanderson Group, good businesses that have been taken out by, by private equity or private equity funded, funded vehicles. Many good ones having moved up. I mean, we hear about some of the really big ones. Boohoo, you mentioned uh, ASOS, of course, remains on AIM, doesn't it? It's one of the Absolutely, uh, massive yeah. stocks. They're not moving nowadays. They don't move. The last one that I can remember that mooted a move was Breed and Green. Group, and they subsequently came out and said, no, we're not going to move because institutions are happy for us to stay on AIM. And that, that's really been a feature of AIM. So they're not moving up, but there are no new ones coming on. Mm. Uh, and I, I would ask, what, what is the London Stock Exchange going to do to re-energise AIM? They need to do something because you've got a wash of money sitting in private equity, which, isn't, which, isn't, which means companies can't come onto the market. just want to return to the point about scandals. Um, what is it that's brought the scandals out this year? Why is this happening? Are they, management uh, come in with a new company, don't understand how the whole system works in the long term, or is it some other thing that's happening which is I think accounting, about? accounting and auditing has been tightened up. You've had some auditing scandals as well. You know, auditors haven't picked up on things. It's often, we see it when often when the new finance director comes on board. I think it, this is what happened at Saatchi. New FD came on board, undertook a brief review, then, then got PwC in to go into the details, and bingo, you, they discovered that the, the things haven't been correct, the numbers are, are wrong. Mm. And MNC Saatchi is a particularly complicated business. 140 circus subsidiaries, it, it, it's always looked a funny one to us. Burford as well. Accounting was always a yeah. bit, you know, yeah. open to attack, which which is what happened. Okay, well, uh, the first of January turns the page, new leaf, new chapter, whatever you like to call it. Uh, how should we view 2020? What is it do you think are going to be the themes, and how should we approach investing in AIM stocks? In, in I think the key years? thing to assess in 2020 is whether the growth engines, the growth companies, are going to keep going, whether they justify their ratings. Uh, or whether we're going to see a return or a, back, uh, a return from some of the, 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 the underperformers, the, the beaten up, and whether there could be some interesting recovery plays there. Um, so really, firstly on the growth, it's hard to justify, it's hard to understand how some of them can even justify current valuations, in my opinion. Um, we brought up well, you know, one company, for example, Blue Prism. It's really, it's really going to have to start to deliver on its uh, perceived promise. Uh, this company had a market cap of over a billion. I think it's about 800 odd million now. And it, it promises a, a, a lot. Um, but ca can it really d deliver on that? And the, the other one we've mentioned um, is Boohoo Group. 
which again, terrific business, very different to Blue Prism. Boohoo is an online retailer, highly profitable. Blue Prism is a pioneer in the use of digital automation, automated ro robots. So totally different, but albeit with technology at the forefront. But Boohoo's on a continues to be on a stratospheric valuation, and we've just seen the founders sell what, 140 odd million a share. I, I was going to say, actually, one of the things that you like about some of these, or the stocks that you follow, are those that have um, skin in the game. The management, the founders, yeah. keep a lot of interest. Of course, that's been happening at Boohoo, but it, as you say, they have been um, whittling that down to some degree. Does that cause you any sort of well, it causes me. I, I mean, they, they remain material holders. They retain so, circa 16% of the stake in the business, but 140 million sell down is, yeah. is a nice Christmas present yeah. or cash in. And you would think, if they really believed, I think, I think they cited the reasons as personal financial planning. Mm -hmm. If you really believe in a business that you know inside out, I would say that your best financial planning is probably <laughs> yeah. re retaining yeah. your stake in the business. Yeah. So it, it does make me start to question where we're going on that one. But w wonderful business, nevertheless. Um, another one that has been trading at a very high multiple, and which is quite hard to understand uh, the tr where, where the true numbers are going, Keyword Studios. Unlike, unlike Prism and Boohoo, this business is very much what's called a buy and build. So it's been growing through very rapid acquisition. I think only today it announced another th acquisition of another three other businesses. So its results, it's hard to decipher what is the, or the true earnings of this business without the acquisitions. Mm. It's seemingly doing very well, it's integrating them, but again, a thir circa 30 times, just under 30 times multiple, it's got to keep pumping out upgrades, and w what are we really looking like in terms of true earnings? So those, those three are good examples of, well, they're already at high multiples, can they keep this going, can they keep the upgrades coming through, are earnings, is earnings momentum going to follow the, you know, the share price? I'm, 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 I'm not convinced in the, for some of them. Yeah. Um, let's move on to take a look on the currency swing. I think you've got a stock that you're following because of what's happening in the currency market. It's RWS. Yeah. Th there you have a, a business that has done terrifically well over the past few years, and we've held it for a long, long time, ever since it was a circa 100 million market cap business, and now it's a 1.4 billion. It's, and it's made a few acquisitions over the last few years. But RWS benefited in the last financial year for, in positively from currency. Weak sterling mm. was, a benef was a benefit. Now we've seen sterling uh, rise, get stronger re around the Brexit, uh, uh, around Brexit and a more, you know, a more definitive uh, pathway for Brexit. Mm -hmm. So their currency's turned against it potentially. For us, that doesn't detract from the business itself, its merits. I mean, current, this business has always had currency swings. Where is uh, it trading in the States? Is this it what, trades what is a lot in the States, reports in UK, mm -hmm. trades a lot in US dollars now, um, and it's, it's got a lot of dollar-based costs as well, so there's a, nat a natural hedge. Is there a case for this company to offload its US business and spin that it's out? It's only just acquired them. So, oh, right. uh, okay. I mean, it's re it really accelerated its growth, you know, and, and it's now expanding to okay. further afield to China as well. So it's, it's going to be increasingly a dollar-based a dollar -based play, um, but a very, a, very, a very nice business indeed. And uh, contrary to, to what's happened at Boohoo, the chairman of this company owns 30 percent, has never sold a share, I don't think, right. which gives us confidence. Maybe we will we'll do one day, but mm. having never sold a share over the last whatever it is 10 or plus years mm. is, is quite phenomenal and, gi and gives other shareholders confidence. But yeah, currency play there could, could be a concern for some, not for us. We're sticking with it. You've got to, in, our, in my opinion, ignore short term currency swings if you're in a stock like this yeah. and look at the bigger picture. So we're talking about recovery versus growth. What about the recovery side? Well, I think there could be terrific opportunities uh, to, to pick up some stocks that may recover very, very strongly. And to illustrate that, we had one company that we've held for a while and stuck with and started adding to in the year, which is CVS Group, mm -hmm. the UK's largest uh, veterinary group. Uh, and that stock was really on its knees. People uh, were very disappointed in the way things were going. It's again a, an acquisition-led strategy, which was buying up more and more veterinary practices, and that and, and it became increasingly hard to pick up the desired practice at the, at the right price, and it lost focus from other areas, and it really it was really sort of struggling partway through the year. But it inherently is a good business in there, and quite a sizable business, so it was never that small. And therefore, it still attracted a lot of institutional interest in it. 
and sticking with it has, you know, we've come out smelling of roses so far. <laughs> yeah. uh, so far, yeah. you never, you never know. This is a, this is a long game, but it's you can see the recovery. It's jumped from just under 400 to. Uh, where we are now, well over a... You know, yes, it's, uh, yes sir, yeah, 1093. Mm. Um, more to come then for CVS? I think so, I think yeah. so. The new CEO in, a previous CEO who, who, who led, led the acquisition straight to begin with, uh, has stepped down, you know, FD's moved to CEO. I think, I think they've really knuckled down and I'm hoping for good things, yeah. continually good things from that business. Yeah. Uh, let's move on. Uh, I was stunned to see that you've got Mother Care on your list. Uh, this is, um, we've been yeah. reporting on this all the way throughout the year, and you can see by looking at the chart, I mean, 2019 has been a relatively stable year, but, but it's been uh, moving around the 10, 12, 14p level. But when you think of this as a stock that was worth almost three pounds, what, two or three or four years ago? Yeah, it's, uh, it's shocking to think, this is a, this business now, and it's actually perked up a bit recently, yeah. has a market cap of only 60 million pounds, which is just over, and it has been a complete basket case. However, there has been a catalyst in our opinion, and the catalyst was the, the offloading that was its UK business fell into administration. This has rid it of a real millstone. UK business, lots of stores, and it was a real drag on the numbers. To, to, to illustrate that, it, uh, it, its UK business lost 36 million, uh, I think, in the last full year, whereas actually it's got a really strong overseas business, franchise business, which made 28 million internationally on franchise revenue of 177. So this business now is very much about its overseas operations, which are profitable. It's just signed heads of terms with Boots as well uh, to franchise in, back into the UK, its brand name around certain products, which is, it, which is interesting. It's growing strongly in India. It's got a, a partnership in India with Reliance Industries. And it could be an interesting recovery story because in there is a very a well -loved, quite a well loved brand, right. yeah, a brand absolutely. that many yeah, yeah, you know yeah. many have sort of started yeah. off with, and I, I think there could be potential. The one risk is it with it, clearly even international was off a bit last year. It, it, growth was down a, a little bit, but the big risk it's still having to carry the pension deficit. Yeah. Uh, a bit, it's quite a big pension deficit, but it's given some breathing space on that. Uh, I think it's been given a, it doesn't have to pay, pay in as much over the next few years. So it's got, it's got a bit of a break and hopefully it can start to rise. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, K3 Capital is another one I know where you've got in this um, uh, recovery stock bracket. Yeah, K3 Cap has already started to perk up and it, it put out a good announcement yesterday which uh, encouraged as well, moved the shares higher. It's a business sales company and, and corporate financing as well. So it, it has been impacted. You can see the shares got very, very high not long after listing and it, 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 they really flew. It, it's low revenue, big margins, 30 plus percent margins, great return on equity, great cash generator. I think you pick up a dividend of just under five percent on it now as well. Mm. Majority owned by founders still, and it needs a more settled environment. And hopefully, with a, a more definitive outcome on Brexit now, it might encourage some of its cut clients, being businesses and business owners looking to sell and, and acquire, mm -hmm. to to use its services a bit more. And we're already seeing the latest update was encouraging, and we're we're seeing you know some positive momentum in there. And you can see where it could get back to. Um, very simple business really, um, clearly there's a bit less visibility than with others but it, it could be a strong recovery play. Bit, we were a bit wary initially, founders sold a lot on IPO and subsequently sold more on within the lock-in period, generally they're locked yeah, in yeah. from selling and they were, I, thought, I thought it was a bit naughty, they sold some more within the lock-in period, they claim because of institutional demand but they're still, they're still big holders in the business. Yeah. Um, next one is uh, Van L Holdings. We're getting on to a couple of stocks now that I don't know too much about. Van L Holdings is a, is, a, is a ground engineering contractor. It does a lot of piling. So it owns the piling rigs, which are used in house building construction. Mm -hmm. It's had big contracts with Network Rail as well. And it, it's, been a, it's been a complete mess. And it listed at a quid, I think. Yeah. And you saw, at that time, you saw the founder and the managing take out 30-odd million quid. 
And then there was all sorts of argy bargy in the boardroom, and the, the founder and, and the founder and his son-in-law tried to engineer their way back into the boardroom. They were rebuffed. You've got, I think, a new a new management team now knuckling down and, and focusing on uh, on the recovery. Management team with experience. Yeah, yeah with, with experience, they got you know they they all got a good background, but clearly they're not big stakeholders in it. Um, the outlook as well has been muted because of you know Brexit delays, yeah, construction yeah. delays. But now you've seen a yeah. again we're back to a more definite outlook, and they're trading it under tangible net asset value, so, which is a lot of piling rigs. Yeah. So you can see if the utilisation comes kicking in, this thing can phew, really really fly. I think they I'm not sure don't rely on the divvy, but their suggested yield is about five percent at the moment. Right, right. But don't rely on that. This is very much a recovery story. And again, even yesterday's muted, cautious outlook statement was greeted with a, a positive Lovely. response from yeah. the share price. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 1 p.m. group uh, is another one uh, I know that you're following, which again, for me, is, is relatively new. I'm not massively up on what's going this on. This is a p.m. bizarre turn of event. This business has not really put, much, uh, foot, put a foot wrong over the last few years, but nobody likes it. Yeah. It's a financier to SMEs, so it provides asset, asset financing for small companies, invoice discounting, all sorts of financing arrangements. It doesn't get involved in vehicle finance, commercial vehicle finance. It also lends on its own book and it also brokers for other, for other lenders. So it's quite low risk and a lot of its deals are, are, are quite, quite, you know, quite simple. So lo lots of small loans and it's managed things really, really well. It's grown nicely. Problem is nobody likes it and it looks to me, it looks absolutely dirty. And cheap. you're telling me as an accountant you can't see anything on there that uh, rings alarms bell? Well, the, 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 the big alarm bell on this is uh, if the defaults kick in. Right. And okay. clearly they, they've got a default rate and they seem to be under control. If you have stress in the economy, SMEs get hurt more than others and you see them defaulting more. Yeah. You know, we saw it many years ago. But these guys have, have proven themselves through some tough times. Mm. Yet it's trading about five times forecast earnings. I mean, what this business turned over, it's about 30 odd million market cap. It turned over 32 million last year and made about eight on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, look, it looks just dirt cheap. A lot of people buy this, this type of stock as a yield play. And it's not offering much of a yield because it wants to safeguard its cash to, to fund growth. Uh, it, it's it really in a catch 22. The shareholder base isn't perfect, but. It, it sh in my opinion, it should be a lot higher than it is now. It should, yeah. you know, much, much higher. Let's just wrap it up and take a look at a stock that you've got for the brave. Yeah, well, this is a stock for the brave, but more, more, more or less, it, it, it illustrates uh, where to be wary. And I, I'm not necessarily recommending this one, <laughs> but many will be looking at this as a, as a, a recovery story. So it's Fire Angel uh, Safety it, Technology. It used to be called Spruages, and this business had a market cap of about 160 million it made decent profits on about 60-odd million turnover a few years ago, and it's been a complete disaster. As you can see, it, um, it sells fire alarms and smoke detectors. Uh, it provides those to the fire service, to housing associations, to the public. Yeah. It's, it's, it's expanding. It's got operations in Europe as well. So it ticks a lot of boxes. It can't make any money. I mean, it just reported sales are up, but it's still loss-making. It's, it's had a falling out with a, a previous partner, part of Newell Rubbermaid Group, the large uh, US, mm. US business. And it, it's really been a falling knife. I mean, a lot of people have looked at it, I suspect, and thought, wow, this has got to be a recovery story. Yeah. And so from 160, you're down to about, about six, seven million market cap business, which still had, but, but it still has decent revenues. So there's about but 40 you, you odd million revenue. the revenues into profit. Why is oh, it on your list? Totally as well? As I say, it's not actually on my list as a, right. it's, yeah. it's, a it's a classic example of right. a stock that a lot of people will be looking okay. at as a recovery, but it should be wary. But, but, but should be very, very wary because it hasn't actually demonstrated anything up to now that it can actually recover. Mm -hmm. But some may be caught in this. Um, it is the, the general thematic around the dangers of playing. Uh, recovery stocks mm. is it and, and, and I would close with thinking what you know what is our outlook for 2020 be careful if you're playing recovery I would always adopt right. a portfolio approach because you might have some huge winners and some total wipeouts mm. you, you might lose everything this this might be one there might be others um, our view is to stick to, to quality you know wonderful business at a fair price yeah. rather than a fair business at a seemingly wonderful price yeah.
Okay, all right, uh, Chris, thanks so much indeed. Um, have a good 2020. We'll Thank be you. We'll be talking to you next year anyway, doubtless, here at IG. That's Chris Boxall from Fundamental Asset Management. He's a portfolio manager there, and if you want to speak to Chris, doubtless he'll pick up the phone or the email uh, through his website.